Coming up, the evil twin is back. Oh, not you again. Tell nice ladies and gentlemen what you did. A coin is being balanced on top of an engine. We go for a long overdue drive, 16 years overdue precisely. And finally, I sit in a garden chair. Welcome back to the second part of Project Malaga, where after 16 years of neglect, this 8 series is finally going to get some much needed DLC as we bring all of its 12 cylinders back to life. Here are some of the parts that we're going to need for this revival. This is probably just the start of it, but you gotta start somewhere. The first thing I want to learn is why this car doesn't want to start. I'm beginning by checking fuel pumps as this is the most common cause. Hola. Now let's see if these pumps are working. Nope, that one is dead. You can hear it clicking, but it's not buzzing. The other one is working, but it's probably weak. All right, so that needs to come out. There it is. So good news, bad news with the fuel pumps. Good news being that this is almost certain reason for this car not starting. One of the pumps that's working, it's an original unit and likely too weak to supply proper fuel pressure. The bad news, an incapable mechanic was already in here. And I say incapable because this is a 30 year old strainer and they tried to patch it up with some glue. Also, we have electrical tape on perished wiring which we all know has phenomenal properties once submerged in fuel. For some reason, they replaced the black tubes with these yellow ones. Also, we have this wire that's broken off. This is for the fuel sender unit. So all in all, uh, I need to do some research, buy parts, and attempt to repair this properly. But first, I need to disassemble all of this. That wasn't even connected to the strainer. Now the other one. Fuel pumps removed. I am then repairing the broken wire for the fuel sender unit. It's pretty sturdy, it's not gonna go anywhere. You can pull on it. So here are the parts that we need to fix the fuel pump assembly. I got some wires, corrugated flex hose, heat shrink tubing, and crimp terminals. I also had to buy a crimping tool, this one, which I got on Amazon. And let me read you this. Professional crimping tools. For the best technicians, the best electrician's tools. Definitely not made in China. Anyway, the game plan is to replace the crack wiring for the fuel pumps. The wiring for the fuel sender unit I'm not going to touch because I think I'll do more harm than good. Besides, I already checked them for continuity and all of these wires are good. Heat shrink tubing and terminals should be fuel resistant, but just to test that theory, I left them sitting in fuel for a couple of days and they're still perfectly fine. They didn't melt or dissolve, so they're safe to use in the fuel tank. Nice and firm. That is the sound that we want to hear. Muy excelente.
Now it's time to attach this flux corrugated hose to here. Haha! Yeah, that is good. Time to see if this thing is working. Oh, yes. There it is. If you are wondering why did I go through the trouble of rebuilding this assembly, a new fuel pump carrier from BMW is 653 euros and all of this including new pumps was less than 120 euros. That is a pretty good cost saving. Before they go back in, I'm replacing the two short fuel lines. Oh, that was close. And that was beautifully executed. Then I need to siphon out the fuel tank and clean it. Here's the bottom of the fuel tank now. It looks pretty good, pretty clean. Carburant sans plomb obligatoire. I'm fluent in French in case you didn't know. Adding fresh fuel and making sure that the bottom of the tank is still clean. Time to rekindle the spark between the fuel pumps and the car. There you go, the gasket is in. That is one working fuel pump assembly. Now to check if the fuel gauge is working. Nope, it is not. That's incorrect, but we'll deal with that later as the priority now is to get the car running. Next up, fuel filters. I'm replacing filters, paying attention to their direction and cutting new fuel lines to size. And this is the finished product. And reinstalled back on the car. Done. We are swiftly moving along to the engine bay to inspect the ignition system. Really ugly, really filthy. I'm removing ignition wires for a closer look. There it is. After checking the resistance of wires, which should be 6 kilo ohms, I found 4 dead wires. More importantly, wires on cylinder 6 and 12 were bad, which means that the fuel supply will be cut to both banks, as those wires contain cylinder identification sensors. Hence, giving us another reason why the car wouldn't start. Enter new ignition wires. And donut sensors. Which we need to put on wires 6 and 12. First thing we need to do is slide this boot over here. Some silicone spray. This. The plug needs to be undone anti-clockwise as it connects to the wire via wood screw. You need this to hold it a bit better and then start unscrewing. So these prongs or tips or however you want to call it, it's important that they are pointing towards the distributor cap, like so. Cutting off a small portion of the wire so that the wood screw grabs a fresh bit of it. Now to verify that the wire is showing correct resistance. That is success. And that's done. Alright. 
fun fact, I thought the intake manifolds were removed at some point and then painted, but nine. They just taped around it and presumably used the spray can to paint it because there's overspray all over the place. Also, the incapable mechanic didn't stop with the fuel pump. As evident here, we have some fuel clamps that were removed from the fuel lines on the back of the engine when he was, I assume, checking for fuel supply and couldn't be bothered to put them back. Isn't that something? I'm then vacuuming the air filter box and spark plug holes. And removing spark plugs. Ah, they installed brand new spark plugs. Beru Ultra. And these are not the correct ones for this car. It's pretty clear that the previous owner and his useless mechanic tried to get this car running. Since I have all of the spark plugs removed, I'm going to do one step extra and spray fogging oil into each cylinder. Just to help lubricate things a bit better for that first start. Fogging oil. For men. After that, I'm turning the engine over by hand. Oh yes, it's turning very smooth. It was time for new spark plugs. Old ones are safe for something else as they are the wrong type for this engine. Replacement of spark plugs completed. For a job well done, I'm rewarding myself with a blueberry muffin. Replacing distributor caps and rotors. To work with more space, I'm installing distributor caps later. Now removing belts and replacing pulleys. Isn't that lovely? There's new versus old pulleys. New pulleys go in while the belts are left off. During the first start, I don't want them to spin the water pump or power string pump until the system is flushed. I also replaced vacuum lines which were another yep. special twig addition. Like snapping twigs and two short fuel lines on the back of the engine. Time for the new distributor caps. The new ignition wires go in. And here's the state of the bottom of the engine. Oil and crud everywhere. Now I'm going to clean up all of this as best as I can. Drop the oil pan and replace the gasket. So let's crack on with that. Let's drain the oil. So while the oil is still draining, I'm going to crack open all of these bolts. Very gently, but it's not like this one. So that's the oil pan, which looks fairly clean. So let me show you the engine. It's actually looking pretty good and clean. Overall, everything looks good. This is very likely the original gasket that the car came with, and it was fused with the pan. A simple job as this one turned into several hours of scraping. Moments like these are when one wishes for a blasting cabinet. That's the old pan done. I cleaned the pan surface as best as I could, but since it wasn't perfect, I'm using a light layer of gasket maker on the pan side. Normally I wouldn't, but I felt it was needed here. To prevent the gasket from moving during installation, I'm using zip ties on several spots to hold it down. And for the bolts, I'll be using tread sealer. And they stepped into oil. Excellent. Once I secure the pan with few bolts, I cut and remove zip ties. For these bolts, I went by feel. Then oil level sensor with new o-ring and finally the drain plug. Mustn't forget the stupid brackets. New filter, give it a good slap. Mm. 
before I attempt to start the car for the first time, I'm also changing differential oil. First the drain plug. Here we go. So here's the diff oil that we're going to be using, the Liquid Moly 75W90. That means it's full. And gearbox oil. That looks fairly clean and that's definitely ATF. New filters. All right, there's nothing else left than to try and start it. Okay, here we go. Nope. Right. Time to consult my repair manual and panic. I started troubleshooting by looking at the spark and it was accounted for on both banks. Fuel pressure was perfect at 3.5 bars. I then realized EMA light was staying on. This light should go off after a few seconds upon turning on the ignition. I hooked up my diagnostic tool and while the engine computer didn't have any codes, EML module did for both banks. I took a closer look at throttle bodies and the flap was opening poorly and the resistance was out of spec when I checked into the multimeter. I grabbed a pair of good used ones from my parts guy. Installed them and this solved that issue. The light was off and there were no more codes, but it still wouldn't start. Next, I decided to remove fuel injectors for a closer look. Yay! Injectors look properly filthy and most of them didn't even activate one supply with 12 volts. That was a good sign actually. I sent them out for cleaning and testing while I tackle other jobs. Like a sinking clutch pedal. Time to attack the brakes and the clutch. I'm beginning by removing and cleaning the brake fluid reservoir. It's like black goo. There it is. And here it is clean waiting to air dry. Since there were signs of brake fluid around transmission bell housing, I'm replacing the clutch slave cylinder. Let's first take off the line. My finger! Oh, that hurts every time. There's the new one. Okay, that's it. These are the new rubber grommets. Perfect. Then the reservoir is reinstalled and brake fluid added. Using a power bleeder, I'm bleeding the clutch line. There we go. Disgusting brake fluid is coming out. And after thorough bleeding, Yes, we have a clutch pedal, a working clutch pedal. Another area that needs addressing is the cooling system. I'm draining the coolant and replacing the expansion tank and thermostat. 
Oops. Here's the new thermostat. Done. At this point, clean and working fuel injectors arrived. Time to give it a whirl once again. Whoa, it fired up. Check if the injectors are leaking maybe. You beautiful bastard. The third is alive, and it's actually working pretty decently. Say what you will about BMW, but this third has been neglected for 20 years, realistically. And look at it now. First, like a kitten, just started, and I'm balancing a two euro coin on top of it. But it's not all perfect. More on that later. I quickly turned it off and proceeded with tasks on hand. The radiator was original and looking rather poor, so I decided to replace it. Now there's one connector here. Yes. Out you come. Now that we have a lot of space for activities, I'm going to put the belts on. There it is. That is one belt done. And this just turned into an unboxing video of the radiator. Ta -da! All right, that's most of the crap connected. New expansion tank. Then I'm adding coolant and bleeding the system. I also drained and replaced power steering fluid. I couldn't resist it anymore and had to find out if the car would move under its own power. First gear. Oh, you beautiful thing. Reverse. We have a running and driving vehicle, ladies and gentlemen. Now to sort out the brakes. First I replaced all of the brake lines and cleaned the bleed screws. After attempting to bleed the brakes I wasn't getting any brake fluid to all four corners which was expected. Searching for the car showed that the fluid was flowing fine from the master cylinder to the ABS pump but no fluid was flowing through the pump. It was completely clogged. Since new units are no longer being produced and bad ones can't be rebuilt I went for the only option of getting a used one. After fitting the new slash used unit the brake fluid was coming out from all four openings on the pump. I put it all back together and this time the brake fluid was flowing smoothly and I was able to bleed the brakes fully. So now the car can stop too. Now back to the engine. The engine sounds good once warmed up, but the cold start was pretty rough.
That'll be the intake money for gas kits. To confirm my suspicion, I hooked up a smoke machine for detecting leaks. Not sure how well you can see this on the camera, but the leak is coming from the intake manifold gasket, as I guessed, so... These are definitely coming off. This assembly begins. Various connectors need to be unplugged as the wiring harness needs to be lifted over the engine. So everything on this side is free. Everything on this side is disconnected as well. So there's two more wires here. Fuel injectors come out again. There it is. Now we have access to nuts that hold the intake manifold. Ooh, there it is. One of the bastards is out. These are the infamous gaskets. A known issue on M70 engine is camshaft banjo bolts that get loose over time. They hold the old spare bar that feeds the camshaft with oil and if the bolts back out, it causes oil starvation and permanent damage can occur. So while I'm in there, I'm removing valve covers to inspect it. Ah. It is out. <laughs> oh, there it is. Come on. Voila. That is in fact a very clean valve car. And even the rubber is still soft. The camshafts are looking lovely. Inners of the engine are very, very clean and camshaft is in perfect condition. None of the bolts were loose, but they were basically hand-tied and would back out eventually. So let's start with the middle one. Here's a better look at the camshaft, which is in lovely condition. To make sure this is permanently fixed, I'm using high strength thread locker and locking tabs. Holes and bolts are thoroughly cleaned and thread locker applied. Banjo bolts are torqued to 12 Nm. Then the tabs are bent. And this is how it looks. I'm repeating the same on the other side. That wasn't very tight. This bank is mint as well. The mating surface is cleaned and so is the valve cover that gets a new gasket. Before the cover goes back, I'm pouring oil over the camshafts. Bit of sauce. A small bit of sealant is put on parts where the covers meet the head, just like they did from the factory. Then the valve cover is reinstalled and not stored to 10 Nm. Finito. While having a good look around everything, I discovered a treacherous coolant leak from the valley pan gasket. This had to be fixed and to access it, many parts need to be removed, including the water pump. Again, the fan clutch needs to come out, coolant drained, fan shroud and expansion tank, thermostat, 
belts and pulleys, and finally a vibration dumper requires removal in order to access water pump bolts. That's one. And that is all of them. Oops. Voila! Fascinating looking thing, isn't it? Next, I'm loosening water pump bolts. I put bolts in order so I know which one goes where. To remove water pump safely, I'm using 3M5 40mm long bolts that are threaded in openings on the pump. And as I'm screwing them on, it's pushing the pump away from the engine. There are two pipes connected on the top which were stuck pretty well. So some prying is needed to separate them. Oh my god, it will not let go. God damn it. So these are the three holes here. The screws go through the back and push the water pump out. Then the pipes can be removed. Behold the valley pan. First I'm scraping off the grime and vacuuming. The valley pan bolts are notorious for easily snapping off, which is something I wanted to avoid. I was soaking them with penetrating oil days before I started this job, and now I'm hitting each bolt with a hammer to put some fear into it and pressure it into loosening up. On the first bolt, I also used a bit of heat. Now, let's set it on fire and turn this engine into crème brûlée. I worked the bolt back and forth and it came out pretty easily. Yes! Out she come, mother That is one out. For the rest of them, I was just smacking them with a hammer, which worked pretty well, and bolts came out trouble free. And that is all of the bolts removed. Oops! I cleaned the surface and vacuumed all of the debris. Clean cover, new gasket and zinc plated bolts. Because the mating surface was a bit rough and to make sure it doesn't leak, I used a thin layer of sealant. This torque is 10 Nm. And that is all of them. Front of the engine was pretty grimy, so I cleaned it up a bit. Pipes are reinstalled with new O-rings and lubed up with silicone grease. Right. I also went for a new water pump. Again, all O-rings are new and lubed up with silicone grease for easier and safer assembly. And it slides right in. So the torque for water pump bolts is 10 Nm. Done. There is a pin on the crank hub for vibration damper alignment. Yep, that's in. Now back to the intake manifolds which were cleaned in preparation for assembly. Old gaskets were in good condition and free of cracks, so they were cleaned and degreased since I'm reusing them with Victor Rind sealing compound. This is a tried and tested method of resealing intake manifold gaskets on this engine and saving some money since new gaskets are around 600 euros from BMW. Surfaces have been cleaned and a thin layer of sealant applied on both mating parts. The torque for the gasket to head is 24 Nm. Then the intake manifold goes back with sealant also applied. To reach the bottom nuts I'm using a long extension 
universal joint and few small magnets shoved in my 10 mil socket to avoid dropping nuts all over the place. This worked perfectly. Torque for the intake manifolds is 10 Nm. And that is the last one. I left it overnight to settle and next day reinstalled fuel injectors along with throttle bodies and fired up the smoke machine. Confirmed that there are no leaks and system is sealed. That looks pretty good to me. Before putting all of it back together, I took apart throttle bodies and cleaned them. Also replaced cabin air filters with Citroen parts. And here's how the cold start sounds now. Sounds absolutely brilliant. That is a beautiful, beautiful cold start. And another one. Absolutely mint. Time to revisit the fuel gauge. After checking the resistance of both fuel sender units, the one on the driver's side was showing wrong value. Upon removal, I discovered the float was broken, so I sourced a good used one. Installed it and... Isn't that beautiful? It has exactly 20 liters in the fuel tank. So that is working perfectly. And piece de resistance, new emblems for the wheel caps. Now the most rewarding part driving the car for the first time Whoa. maiden voyage yes there we go second gear <laughs> she's a beautiful machine brakes yes Bellissima. Unfortunately, this car doesn't have a German tooth, therefore it cannot legally be driven on the streets of Germany. So this small drive in the yard is all you and I can settle for. Wow! Pop of headlights? Yes. No errors on the dash. The temperature is holding pretty nicely. The fuel gauge is working. Moving on to the interior of the car. Front seats have a typical twisting issue where only one half of the seat bottom moves while the other one does nothing. The passenger seat didn't move at all. But these are complete kaput. I'm removing the seat to fix it, and this also gives me a good opportunity to clean the carpets. Yeah, yeah. Tilt it that way. This is one of the heaviest seats. And it's starting to rain. Oh, it's heavy. It is very heavy. Fix for this is rather simple and free. Like this. First, the cable is removed from the motor, and then cable sheet trimmed roughly 15 millimeters. This way more of the cable can be pushed into the motor so you can engage with it properly where before it was just slipping. With that done on the passenger seat as well, it was time to clean the interior. To clean and treat the leather I'm using leather eek. First I vacuumed and brushed the seats thoroughly. And this is the condition of the leather. Using an applicator I'm applying rejuvenator oil liberally. Then massaging the oil into all surfaces and crevices of the leather. They are being left to bake in the sun while I start on the interior. As this question comes up often, these are some of the cleaning products that I use. And now I can cue the music.
The final step for the leather is to clean it with pristine cleaner and damp microfiber cloth. The end result is a fresh supple leather that has a clean matte finish. Wear areas would benefit from re-dyeing, but for 30 year old light color leather, they are looking pretty good. Once the seats are back in the car, I can test if my repair was successful. Yes! It is working. I am a strong man. Job well done. The interior looks amazing and it is a beautiful place to find yourself in. It took a decent amount of effort to bring this legend back to life, but seeing it run and drive is a marvelous sight to behold. The final outcome is fulfilling knowing that another E31 has been revived. As a conclusion to this series, I made a breakdown of parts that were needed for repairs and their cost. More work remains to be done, but new owner will take care of that as the time has come to say goodbye to this beautiful car. Now that the Project Malaga is finished, I can focus back on Project Dubai and getting it ready for German Tooth. Also, M5 needs a bit of work, so expect a video on that as well. Oh, not you again. Tell nice ladies and gentlemen what you did. Right, I might have bought another project. And it's coming from far, far away. Und. It has 10 cylinders and three pedals. Get to the highlight. It's a <coughs> bit <coughs> broken. What was that? It's quite broken. There it is. Congrats, moron. You just financially ruined yourself. Idiot. I don't get it. I thought it would be happy. It's a broken BMW. Whatever. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, please consider supporting the channel by subscribing to it. Bye. Are you insane? You bought a car halfway across the world, sight unseen, not even a pre-purchase inspection. What's the matter with you? What if you don't get to see it at all? What if it comes and has three wheels, half an engine? What then, genius? I mean, you've done some stupid things in your life, but this is just my top of it. Mm -hmm.